I started consulting part-time close to two years ago, and I've received a bunch of inquiries about securing a Synology NAS device and ensuring it's configured following best practices. What I've slowly started to realize is that the majority of people that I've worked with are concerned about the NAS itself and focus on attempting to harden the NAS by confirming it's set up in a secured way. That's generally where I come in. Someone is concerned the NAS can be hacked and want someone that they consider to be more of an expert than they are on the topic to ease their mind and ensure them that it's set up properly. I don't blame them because your data security is extremely important, but it's given me the context to realize that this topic needs some clarity to help people feel more comfortable. So the videos I've done on the security of a Synology NAS focus around DSM itself. And of course that comes into play because DSM is the operating system and there are tools to help you secure your NAS that are built into DSM but there's also a lot of networking that plays into security. Things like port forwarding, VLANs, and firewalls that can totally change the overall security of the device by limiting exactly what can and cannot access it. So in this video, we're gonna look at a complete holistic view of NAS security by looking at the NAS, but more importantly, exactly how people can connect to the NAS. We'll look at networking, authentication, tests to validate exactly how secure the NAS itself is, and then try and come up with a game plan to put you on the right path to not only secure your NAS, but secure your entire network and any device that's on it. So to get started, the first thing we need to look at is exactly which devices can access the NAS. To put this into context, if you have a traditional ISP modem and router, you most likely have one Wi-Fi network or possibly a second if you have a guest network, and all of your personal devices will exist on that one network. Those devices can be PCs, mobile phones, security cameras, IoT devices, and generally a lot more. If your NAS is on your local network, that means that all of those devices can technically access the NAS. It doesn't mean they can authenticate, but it means they can access it through the network. We're gonna call these internal devices because they're devices you own. The first step we need to do is determine exactly which devices should communicate with the NAS device. Generally, this will be mobile phones, computers, and servers. If you're running a media server, you might have a few smart TV devices as well. Now, there are going to be outliers, but our goal here is ensuring that the devices we are absolutely positive will need to access the NAS are marked. An example will be something like a Wi-Fi thermostat. It doesn't need to access the NAS, but it technically can. Group those devices together, and as soon as you know exactly which devices they are, we're gonna move on to the next step, which is external devices. Now, remote access to a Synology NAS is generally the first thing that a new user wants to do. So how exactly are you doing it? Are you using a VPN like OpenVPN or Tailscale? Are you using Quick Connect? Are you using a reverse proxy? Are you port forwarding? If none of that sounded familiar, Good, because you probably didn't configure any of it and can start fresh. We need to figure out exactly how devices from outside of our local network can connect to it. The first thing you need to do is check your port forwarding rules, and the best place to do it is on your router. Each router is different, but if you Google the name and model of your router, you should be able to find out how to sign into it. As soon as you're there, find the port forwarding section. If there's anything in this list, you need to figure out exactly how it got there and why it's there. In a best case scenario, it'll be blank. If you see anything tied to the local IP address of your NAS, you need to audit exactly why it's there. If none of this makes sense to you, open DSM, access the control panel, and check exactly which ports are used for the web interface of DSM. Open a web browser and access the port checker link in the description of the video. Select custom ports and type those two ports in. If either of them say open, there's a problem and technically people from outside of your local network can access DSM, which is a problem. If it's closed, select the server ports option and scan it again. If all of those time out, you can be fairly certain that you're not using port forwarding or reverse proxy. If you're using a VPN, good. Depending on the VPN you're using, you might have to port forward, and if that's the port that's open to the world, that's fine. If you don't have anything set up, look into configuring a VPN. It's the best and most secure overall option. We can harden the security of DSM, but it will generally revolve around authentication, which we'll get to in a little bit. So at this point, we know which internal devices can access the NAS and exactly which external devices can access the NAS as well. If you're using port forwarding and it must stay that way, you need to use Synology's firewall to limit access on that port. Follow this video to do that. Now that we're aware of the internal devices that should and shouldn't access the NAS, we need to switch over to network security. 
You've probably heard the term VLAN before, but what is it? In its simplest form, a VLAN allows you to segregate your network and access is determined by firewall rules. Rather than a device having an IP address on the same subnet as the LAN, it'll have its own subnet and we can limit access down from one subnet to another using firewall rules. Using the thermostat example from before, we know that the thermostat shouldn't be able to access the NAS. So the NAS should be on the LAN network and the thermostat should be on a separate VLAN. We'll then limit access with firewall rules and configure it so that the thermostat VLAN can't communicate with the LAN network. That problem is then taken care of. The thermostat can no longer communicate with the NAS. Now to do this, you're probably going to need a more powerful router than an ISP router and truthfully, a lot of consumer routers too. If you wanna go the extreme route, look into PFSense or OpenSense, but the learning curve is steep and if you're a beginner, don't start here. If you want a very powerful router that's easier to learn, look into something like a unified dream machine, which I'll leave a few links to in the description. It's powerful, has a huge community, and there are a ton of awesome tutorials online that will help you understand exactly how it works. If you want something easier but less powerful than those options, look at something like a Synology router. The truth is it doesn't matter which you pick, but it must support VLANs. This will give us a way to segregate our network and get those trusted devices separated from the untrusted devices. The bulk of people will have three main networks, a primary network, which will be the LAN, an IoT VLAN, which will be your smart home devices, potentially security cameras, and just about anything that isn't trusted, and a guest network. Each will have its own Wi-Fi network to connect to, and access between all three networks will be managed by firewall rules. This means that if you want to allow access from your LAN to the IoT network, you can allow it, but you'd block access from the IoT network to the LAN. When a friend or family member asks to connect to your Wi-Fi, they go on the guest network. Remember, trusted devices and untrusted devices. This setup is its own tutorial, and I plan on doing a sample setup with PFSense and a unified device in the future, so get subscribed if you wanna see that. But I also went over a sample setup in this video on a Synology router. Once the VLANs are set up, make sure the untrusted devices connect to either the IoT or guest network and your LAN will be reserved for trusted devices only. You don't have to do this right this second, but it is something you should do if security is a concern. This won't only benefit your NAS, it'll benefit anything that's running on your local network. And I know, it's going to seem like overkill for most, but the bulk of security is limiting who and what can access a specific device and VLANs will take care of that. Next is authentication. Authentication is an interesting one because the simple answer is to configure two-factor authentication. And if you don't have it set up, you should. However, the future is passwordless sign-ins. If you look at how you access your accounts right now, you generally type in a password, and if you have two-factor authentication enabled, you'll either get a text message or type in a code from an authenticator app. So why is this a fairly weak authentication process? Mainly because the actual information is generally typed in. Passwords can be attained through a phishing attack or if a device has some sort of keylogger installed. Two-factor authentication can be phished as well, but mobile notifications are weak against SIM swapping attacks, though that generally applies to your online accounts. This is why biometrics is actually a security enhancement. You're not actually typing in the password after you do it the first time. So with that in mind, the future of signing into accounts is with something called passkeys. Passkeys are still relatively new, but the idea is that a passkey can be generated from a device, password manager, or with a hardware key like a YubiKey. This form of authentication has multi-factor authentication built in. Because using the YubiKey as an example, you are physically pairing the hardware key, which is one factor, with some form of biometrics or PIN code, which is the second factor. It's also impossible to get these credentials through a phishing attack, so it's already more secure than passwords. Now right now, Synology DSM supports passwordless login, but it requires you to have your own domain with a valid SSL certificate, and you cannot use Quick Connect or an IP address. I have a video on how you can configure DSM as a domain with a valid SSL certificate internally, and I'll leave a pop-up for it now. But if you don't have a valid certificate and domain name, you won't be able to use a passkey. If you do have a domain and SSL certificate, the hardware key can be used as a passkey, which is true passwordless sign-in. It can also be used as a second factor for two-factor authentication, meaning you log in with your DSM password, then put in the hardware key and use the passkey as your second factor. They both function the same. 
but one requires your DSM password and the other doesn't. If you don't have a valid SSL certificate and domain, you can still use a YubiKey, but you'd configure it with OTP. Rather than using an OTP app, you'd use the YubiKey app, plug in your YubiKey into your phone, and the code would only be available with the key. It's not as good as using a passkey, but it's better than using traditional two-factor authentication. Now, exactly who should set this up? Quite honestly, if your NAS is exposed externally, you need to have at minimum two-factor authentication with OTP configured. But with how reasonably priced these YubiKeys are, it's a more secure overall option, and if security is your concern, it makes sense to look into them. You can also use it with tons of other websites and password managers as well. So it's not like you're solely buying it for your NAS. With that said, you need to buy at least two of them so you have a primary and a backup, with the preferred option being three total a primary backup and an offsite backup. So the same way that you need a three to one backup strategy for your data, the same holds true for hardware keys. You can technically reset the admin account on your NAS with physical access to the NAS if you ever lose the YubiKey. So if you're only using it for your NAS, buying one of them isn't that crazy, but the chances are high you'll use it for various things and that's where buying multiple makes sense. So now that we discussed the networking and the authentication options you can use, to harden the security of your NAS, you can look into hardening DSM itself. This is going to be fairly basic stuff like enabling auto block, changing the default ports inside of DSM, potentially using Synology's firewall, and requiring two-factor authentication for all of your users. I've done videos on that, so I'll link them below if you're interested in making those changes. But the benefit of taking this approach is if you have a few select trusted devices that can access the NAS, this all becomes less important. Rather than trying to strengthen DSM, we've lowered the attack surface on DSM to trusted devices only and don't have to stress as much about those settings as we did in the past. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't configure DSM in a secure way. It just means that everything around DSM has been strengthened as well. If you can't follow along because your router doesn't support VLANs, the first step is to look into a router you can use that supports them. Like I said earlier, the sweet spot for most will probably be a unified device, and I have a few links in the description for ones that I recommend. But any router that supports VLANs will allow you to segregate your network. Those routers will also support things like VPNs, so remote access will be a lot easier, and you'll have granular controls over everything. This is the first step to network security, which indirectly secures your NAS as well. As soon as your network is segregated, look into your authentication options and the overall attack surface of DSM should be minimized, which will help the overall security of the device. This was a lot, but I'm hoping it helped highlight some network and authentication best practices. And if you have all of this configured, you can be fairly certain that your NAS is very well protected. That doesn't mean it's impossible to have some sort of security breach, but very, very unlikely. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. But if you made it this far, thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next time.